Hello, 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 YouTube. It is Chosen and Cha Cha here. How's everybody doing? So uh, last week we did um, Chosen's um, testimony, and um, I hope you all are blessed by it. And um, we thought it would be a good idea to now do my testimony so you guys can know a little bit more about me and um, more about us. And so he's going to ask the questions now. So we just wanted to show you him, and he's going to sit across and... Um, yeah, you want to say anything? No? <laughs> no, just, you know, how's everybody doing? And welcome to another episode of Chosen and Cha Cha. And hope you guys enjoy um, Girlfriend's Testimony. All right, thank you. Let's get started. <clears throat> All right. Anything you want to say before we start with the questions? Or oh, just um... go ahead. Uh, it's obviously our desire to bring God glory. So I hope that, um, you know, whoever hears this, it's a blessing to you, um, that you're not alone. You know, I believe testimonies are meant to bless others. So yeah, go ahead. Amen. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's see what we got. Let's see what we got here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah. So again, yeah, similar, um, Let's start off with um, your upbringing, your childhood. Tell us a little bit of where you're from, where you were born, right. your parents. Go ahead. So I am born and raised in Santa Barbara, California. I am my mother and father. I am they. Well, my dad was born in San Diego. My mom, I want to say, I think it was Bakersfield, but we we're born. I'm born and raised in Santa Barbara. Um, so my father had a total of, I want to say three, six children. And my mom had four. And so of my mom's children, I'm the youngest. So from my mom's kids, there's the oldest, Andy, and then Deanna, Herman, and then myself, Selena. My real name is Selena, but my nickname is Chacha. Um, and then I'm the youngest of my mom's kids. My father had Kyle, Herman, me, and then Ronnie, Ivani, and Danny. And so um, my dad has six kids. So I was really raised, though, with my mom's kids because my mom's the one that raised a single mom of four kids. Um, so I was raised with Andy, Deanna, and Herman. And so for us, even though Herman is my full, like, same mom, same dad, but the other two, Dan and Andy, I never saw them as half because we were all raised together by my mom. And so, right yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, so you grew up in the church, right? Um, I did. Tell us a little bit about how that was growing up in the Christian church, a Christian household. Go ahead. So growing up in the church, you know, I do praise God on many points that I was because I did learn a lot of things about the Bible and about the Lord that definitely have kept me out of certain trouble. But there were other things that weren't so good. Um, things that I would say, instead of really that they were Bible based, it was just more a personal belief. So we were taught growing up, you know, from through the church that you shouldn't wear makeup, um, shouldn't wear, you know, like mini skirts or whatever. And I'm um, just more of, I guess you can call it like, um, super strict and um mm -hmm. it really wasn't based on scripture it was just oh you shouldn't do this or do's and don'ts and that for me really messed with my head growing up because i thought like everything that i enjoyed was like bad it was bad to dance it was bad to do that or you know bad to wear makeup or i, I remember you know one time a young woman in our church got scared because she had put perfume on and she was really scared because it was strong smelling and it was just like, wow, like you realize the damage that it did. So it did a lot of damage to me um, over the years. And so it took a, the Lord quite a while to heal me from that. But there were also many good things that I did learn or experienced, I should say. Um, I got to definitely see the move of the Holy Ghost in the church, which I praise God for that. Those are the things that are priceless. You know, seeing the Holy Ghost move and work is a blessing. It's a privilege to be witnessing that. Um, 
I got to really learn some deep things of the Bible that have definitely carried me through life. Um, again, praise God for that. Um, and I have good memories. You know, every Sunday, Grandpa would give us quarters. My mom would take us to Foster Freeze and would get us ice cream, go home on a Sunday afternoon and watch the Munsters have lunch and then go back to evening service. So there were also good memories, but definitely it was a lot of strictness. And I think um, mm-hmm. that for me did a lot, a lot of emotional mm-hmm. damage. It okay. was hard. It mm-hmm. was hard. Yeah. So um, at what point did you leave the church? Was um, I know your mom, your mom had left the church. Um, you could tell us why or a little bit about that. And then eventually you leaving the church. Go ahead. So I am. Um, At my earliest memories, we were already in the church. So I only knew to be in church. Um, But of course, we'd go with my mom because we were kids. Um, It was an all Spanish church. Um, But of course, you know, my mom only spoke enough Spanish to get her by, but didn't really know it fluently. And so sometimes it was hard for her to understand the full sermons and what was being said. Um, So after many years of being in the church, she was just frustrated because she didn't want to just go to any church. Like you don't want to just go to any church that's going to water down the word. You don't want to go to just any church that's going to tell you what you want to hear and tickle the word, you know, tickle your ears. You want to go to a church that really is, you know, preaching the word of God. And um, so it was important to my mom that we were in that church. Um, And so Mm -hmm. because it was all Spanish, though, she struggled. So one day she had expressed to one of the sisters there like that she was frustrated and it was all Spanish. She's having a hard time like listening, you know, like understanding. And um, yeah, that was his phone. (laughs) And um, and so um, anyways, the sister actually looked at my mom and was like, well, this is the Spanish Church of God. And my mom said at that moment, she thought to herself, oh, well, I thought this was like a church where it's God's church, you know, people should be able to come here. So that really offended my mom and and it hurt her. But there is a verse in the Bible that talks about having blood on our hands. And when that sister said that, that was the final straw that just pushed my mom out of the church. So my mom later on said that she had prayed and she had made a decision to leave the church. She had prayed to the Lord and why she was leaving the church. Ultimately, you know, my mom was no longer in the church. We weren't going to church because obviously we went with my mom. I think we went a couple times after her without my mom, but again, we were minors. So we just pretty much stopped going. And my mom would, you know, obviously you know, part of the world now and going out with cousins and whatnot and, you know, doing her thing, you know, with, you know, she was still a great mom, of course, don't get me wrong, she did her responsibilities, but I meant, but now she would, you know, she was going out to like, you know, have a, go to the bar here, go, you know, go out with the family or whatever. And then ultimately as kids, teenagers, we were more involved with the world. We weren't involved with church stuff because we were no longer in church so that one sister's actions literally had a ripple effect oh, it wow. knocked my mom out of the church it took us out of my mom's kids out of the church because she offended so that one person affected five of us where we stopped going to church so uh, that was wow. like that's really? blood on that person's hands and that's serious the bible talks about that and so um, yeah, so that's why we stopped going. Um, yeah. It, and it's disappointing that she, that she would do that. Because I know what that feels like to have someone knock you down when you're already feeling that, right. Right. you know, yeah. and you're trying to hold on. And she just took the scissors and <laughs> fall, you know, to my mom. And it was like, wow. So would you, would you say that that's what... um. What, what led to you really going into the world and start kind of partying or, you know, share about that, that led, you know, into other stuff like getting into a, a bad relationship and having your your first daughter. So right. go ahead. 
So we were in the world, of course, um, and I just started hanging out with my friends, doing my thing, you know, graduated high school, whatnot, turned 18, got a job. My first job was working with a lot of, you know, people my age group, a little bit older than me. So, of course, we all hung out or whatnot. By the time I turned 21, that's when I started getting wild. But now I'm 21. Now I can go into the club. Now I can go to the bars, you know. And um, so that's what I did. I partied for a good long year. And after that year, um, there was one particular night I was partying with my homegirl, Donna. She was like my weekly, like, we're going to go out. We're going to party. She was my weekly home, you know, party homegirl. Uh, her boyfriend would stay home, watch the kids, their kids, and then me and her would go out and party. And uh, and so, um, yeah, so after, like, doing all that, then there was one night I was at the club again, and um, they had, like, four different platforms. And that particular night, you know, if you're on the platform, you don't need a dance partner because you're on the platforms. And each platform can fit, like, up to eight, ten people. And so me and my homegirl were up there. We were just dancing, doing our thing. And that night, for some reason, I don't know why that night was different than any other night, but that night I noticed like people kept wanting to dance with me. These men just wanted to dance with me. And I was like, I don't want to dance with you. I just want to be by myself, do my thing, just get my dance on. I'm on the platform. Don't need no dance partner. Leave me alone. So every time somebody would try to dance with me, I would tap my girl Donna and then she would turn towards them like back off because I just want to be left alone. When I'm dancing, man, I'm in my own world. And so then, you know, finally people got the hint, left me alone. I'm dancing. And then finally I decided to take a little break. And I knew the DJ, John. He was a really nice guy. And so I would go up to the DJ booth, you know. And so this time I decided to get down from the platform. And I jumped up to the DJ's booth. It was like two or three feet off the ground. And uh, when I went up, right when I got up, I felt somebody tap me on my leg. And I turned around and it was this guy and he was like, hey, my friend wants to dance with you. And he pointed and I looked over and I saw the friend and I was like, OK, tell your friend that I will dance with him um, at the last two songs of the night. I always knew when the last two songs were because John, the DJ, always played two slow songs to end every party night. So uh, so he was like, OK, so that's what I did. I, you know, so I went up, hung out with John for a minute went back to the tap platform, started dancing again. And then boom, John puts on the slow songs eventually. And so then I flagged that dude down and that was my daughter's father. And um, but little did I know that that's what he would become. Um, I just danced, right? And then um, we ended up, you know, we were attracted. And um, so we exchanged numbers, went out the next day he you know wanted to go out so we went out the next day because that was friday night so saturday night we went out and we hit it off great we hit it off great um ended up just and again i was 22 i you know i wasn't taking life serious i wanted to party i wanted to do my thing and so i um, figured he would just be one date but no it led to more and ultimately we ended up as a couple we i um, we're living together. Um, within like three months, I got pregnant. Um, but wow, that's when the Lord began to deal with me. I was six months pregnant, and the Lord was like, "This is wrong, and you know better." Because the Lord has shown me that in His eyes, marriage is until death do you part, and so. He had told me that um, he was going through a divorce. He was just waiting some finalization papers, showed me these papers that had like plaintiff, defendant. They were numbered down the side of the paper. So it all looked legit to me because I've never been married till this day. I, I'm ignorant to that stuff. I didn't know. I, I looked kosher. They looked like kosher legal documents. And he was just like, yeah, I'm just waiting for the finalization papers in the mail. That's it. And then I guess it would be considered divorce. I was like, oh, all right. So um, we stayed in the relationship. Um, and it was, again, that was like the three-month mark. And um, we're already living together. We're staying in Lompoc. And um, then he went to go run an errand. No, we went together to run an errand. He comes back 
and then we go to our friend's house where we were staying and he tells this friend the guy um oh well i found out that she never signed the papers and i was like what and he was like he told he, he told the girl's guy that we were staying with yeah i found out that she never signed the papers that i guess his wife had never signed the divorce papers and ultimately later on it came out that he knew he lied to me that he knew that the papers he showed me were phony they were false um but he just wanted to hook up with me and so he lied yeah huh great way to start a relationship but because i was already in the relationship we were already staying together um we were living together it was like i wasn't just gonna leave at that point um and I had already had feelings for him and all that. And so we ended up moving out of Lompoc into Santa Barbara um, and um, got a place there. I got pregnant. Um, and then about six months pregnant was when the Lord showed me, you know, the truth. Um, marriage is until death do you part. Not until you get sick of the marriage. Not until they cheat on you, but until death do you part. And so the Lord said it had to be. It was just this conviction that I was feeling. And ultimately, my mom actually called me one night and was like, Selena, you know the truth, you know. And she just laid it out and said, why do you think your aunt's been single all these years? And if you don't believe me, call her. So I called my auntie and she was able to just back it all up in scripture. And again, you know, as the Lord was convicting me, the Lord was right. I knew the truth. I was brought up in the word. And so um, the Lord let me know through conviction, bad enough to go to hell yourself. It's going to be even worse knowing you drug someone down with you. Man, that, whew, that hits you. Like, when the Holy Ghost deals with you, you know. Make no mistakes. And the Lord showed me, if you really love him, you're going to do what's right and you're going to let him go. It has to be you because you know the truth. You were brought up in it, not him. And he didn't understand it. So the Lord let me know it had to be me. So I ultimately made the decision that I wanted to serve the Lord and I couldn't do that and stay in my sinful situation that God saw his marriage until death do you part. And he needed to work that out. And I told him that I was going to leave, let him know why. You could see the baby after the baby's born whenever you want. But as far as um, me and him were concerned, we were done. I was going to leave. And um, ultimately, I left. I even actually called his wife because they have a son together, and she would bring the son to stay with us. And she was a nice lady. I really liked her. Um, and I told her, you know, this is I'm leaving, and this is why I'm leaving. Um, this is what the Lord is showing me, and I'm going to pray that God heals your marriage. Um, and then that day that I left, um, I didn't know where I was going to sleep. I just knew I wasn't going to stay there. So I literally am six months pregnant, have my little organizer, and $3 in there, and the keys. And I was thinking, where can I sleep tonight? And I was going to literally stay in the bushes on the east side at the main post office because I figured I'd be safe there. I grew up on that side of town. So that's where I was gonna go. Um, so he had already went to work and um, I walked out the door, locked it and left, called my friend, told her what I'd done. And she was like, what? Nah, call me back. I'll be back in 10 minutes. I said, all right. Oh, man, when you make a decision for God, oh, how he works. Because I called her back, and she was like, Selena, I talked to my husband. There's no way you're going to stay on the street being pregnant. You're going to, where are you? I'm going to come get you. So she came and got me, picked me up. And mind you, like, I'm emotional now. I'm upset, right? This was hard to do. But it was either going to be God or it was going to be a man. I chose to put God first. And I'm... Um, and so she came and got me and little did I know God was already moving behind the scenes because she knew one of my other relatives who knew other people 
ultimately the Lord opened a door for me to go live at a Christian maternity home where you pay for half a room and you get a lot of nurturing, Lamaze classes, a lot of support, and you pay $300 a month. It was a Christian maternity home with other pregnant girls and that was a great experience. So I never had to sleep on the streets. The Lord began to open the door immediately. So three days after staying with Jean and her husband, then I was um, moved into um, the Villa Magella in Goleta. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's talk about um, how you really gave your life to Christ now. You know how that situation you know, it really affected you really surrendering, reconciling your, your life back to back to the Lord. What was that like? What was that moment like, that experience? And then what, what happened after your experience in serving God for, you said, 20 years now? There about that. So when I first came to the Lord while I was still pregnant, I stayed saved for about six, seven years. And it was an amazing experience. I experienced God in a way I never thought, and I see the doors that he opened for me. But what ended up happening is after seven years of being single and alone, um, I started getting sidetracked, and I started getting lonely. And I was also very overweight, much more than I am now. And um, this man walked in. I had two jobs, and so the man walked into my second job, and uh, I was working at Sears at the time, and he um, was very flattering and was really making me feel pretty. And um, I was like, wow, here's this handsome man paying attention to me, you know, just like, wow. And so in my desperation, you know, we hooked up and um, he turned out to be one of the worst people that I could possibly hook up with. Um, he was an alcoholic. He was a junkie. Um, he, what we did have people in common. He knew people that I knew um, because he was um, like a nephew of a lady that I knew, and she was a really sweet lady. But he, unfortunately, was, you know, I hate to say it this way, but kind of like the bad seed. You know, he was the bad apple. His decisions that he made, but. I was so deep into the relationship with him. I had just fallen so far from the Lord. Um, dude, literally one day I came out of the trailer. We were staying in his trailer. I came out to a gun pointed right at me. Oh, man. Let me tell you something. When someone's pointing a gun at you, everything stops. Life stops. It stops. Everything just goes silent. It stops. And he shot the gun twice, past his ear, back to back, boom, boom. Wow. Talk about dodging a bullet. <laughs> that was the Lord that spared me. But this is how low my self-esteem was. That I stayed with the idiot. I stayed with him. Because... They begin to tear your confidence down. Like, you ain't going to find someone as good looking as me. And look at me, and I'm overweight, this or that, not very pretty. Um, you begin to believe that they get into your head. Um, and he was like, oh, I was just kidding. You kidding? You're going to kid with a gun? You could have killed me. But I was stupid and I stayed. Um, I will regret ever, always regret ever getting involved with that idiot. I cannot express that enough. Um, but, yeah. So, ultimately, I left. I came back to the Lord. The Lord began to talk to me again. And... Um, this is where I got real because we ended up having to move. And so he was going to go stay with his cousin in Satakoy. I was going to stay with one of my friends in Goleta, but we were still a couple. And this is when the Lord really began to deal with me again. 
And I couldn't shake the feeling because we were still a couple. We just weren't living together at this point. So the Lord was like, I could feel it in my spirit. Like, you're going to die soon. I'm like, what? You want to die soon? And I just couldn't shake the feeling because I was supposed to pick him up, take him to family court for his daughter a week later. And when that, that feeling began to come, I'm... Um, no, it was for two weeks, but the week later, the second week when it was becoming stronger, like, man, the Holy Ghost was just convicting me, like, you are going to die soon. And I remember feeling it so heavy, that conviction, it was so thick, you can cut it with a knife. It was so thick. Um, and I called one of my friends. Um, he you know, knew my father, knew my aunt, went to school together, so he was more like a father figure. And then after I called him, I called my auntie ultimately, and um, I was just telling her, man, I got this feeling like God keeps telling me I'm going to die soon, mm. and I, I need to come back to him. But at this point, I'm so far from God. Other believers had treated me horribly because I backslid in, and it just, you know, it was bad. It was a bad experience. And so I um, called her. She's like, come to the house. I'll meet you outside. So I drove to the house. She came at me in the car. And she, I just told her what I was feeling. Like, man, the Lord keeps telling me I'm going to die. I just keep feeling this. I can't shake it. I can't shake it. And she was just like, you need the Lord. You need to give your life back to the Lord. And which meant not just praying, meant real repentance. I had to walk away from Matt. I had to walk away from all my sin. I had to really turn my back on it and turn to the Lord. And so I didn't even know how to pray at this point. And so I asked her, well, will you pray with me? Can you help me? She was like, yeah. So she prayed with me and walked me into the sinner's prayer. And I gave my life back to Christ. And immediately everything was done with him. I didn't talk to him. I didn't contact him. Nothing him. He was cut off. I, I, I stopped all the stuff, partying, whatever. It just stopped. I had to start living the right way. And um, it was from that point on that I've been serving the Lord ever since without backsliding. So now I've been like 19 years serving the Lord. So. Amen. Okay. So let's go into a little bit about <clears throat> how you started uh, the Cha Cha channel and how that became an outlet for you doing YouTube, you know, there are more and more hard times in every life. Um, you know, um, go ahead. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so my father passed away in, you know, like 2012, 2014, that time frame, my father, it was unexpected. And that really took its toll. I was a single mom, never married, raising my daughter, doing my thing. And mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of responsibility. Mundo. <laughs> and uh, it's a joke. Go, go, and go. Uh, so anyways, um, <laughs> anyways, um, yeah, so single parenthood is hard. I'll tell you that right now. Anybody thinks it's easy, man, they don't know what they're talking about. Single parenthood is hard because as a woman, you want to be just the woman, but you can't. You're the protector. You're the discipliner. You're the provider. Like for me, when it just me and my daughter, like I would sleep close to the door. So if anybody was going to break in our house, she can get out. They were going to get to me first. I was always on guard looking around. I mean, I was probably worse than a father. Anybody trying to date her. And like I was, I was strict. As a mom, <clears throat> and everything that had to get done, throw out the trash, do this, climb ladders, carry this, do that. That was all me. I had to do it, you know, get to work, rain or shine, walk in the rain, do what you got to do, you get it done. And so, you know, that was hard. It was hard. And um, after my father died a couple years later, more stress would come on me, more. I was done. I couldn't take any more. My brain went into overload. And I ultimately suffered a nervous breakdown in 2015. 
And that was scary. I had nobody. The people that should have helped me didn't. My daughter was taken care of, but I was left to myself. I was like, great, you're helping my daughter, but you're not helping me, and I'm the one that's sick. And I ended up sleeping in my truck. And it was scary because as a female being homeless, you could be raped and they could break into And my truck was old. It was like a 94 Nissan pickup. It was the beat up and the back window was even broken. So it could easily be slid open. And it was just a lot. Well, the Lord provided. And over the years, I would always go to Arco and fuel up gas. And I got to know like this like gangster cholo there. He was always nice to me, some young kid. And then um, one day I went in and he was like, oh, yeah, I remember you. How are you doing? And I just told him the truth, like, I'm homeless right now. Like, I'm still sick, whatever. And he was like, well, you know what? He goes, if you want to park here at night, I'm here these nights. You can park next to my truck. I'll keep an eye on you and I'll make sure nobody messes with you while you're sleeping. And I was like, wow. And then I ran into a cousin that worked at a hotel and so I would be like four nights, four or five nights a week at the gas station at night, parked next to Oscar's truck. And then I would be at the hotel a couple nights hanging out with them. So thank God the Lord provided at least a safe, well, I didn't have to worry about someone trying to rape me. Because being homeless as a dude is bad. It's worse being a female because we're more at risk of getting raped. Um, and it's awful. Um, so... Yeah, ultimately in the nervous breakdown, after talking to different pastors, you know, I like what one pastor said. He just said he would trust God and get off medicine and let God do the work, basically. He goes, but you pray about it. You see what God wants you to do. So I was like, yeah, if God made me without the help of man, then God can heal me without the help of man. And if he doesn't, he has his reasons. So without even realizing it, I like yielded to whatever God's will was. First time I ever done something like that, right? Didn't even realize I was doing it, but I, like how many of us really yield willingly to God's will? But that's what I did. And later on, that's what the Lord would show me that I did. And so I just went cold turkey off of the anti-anxiety pill. <coughs> and going through those withdrawals was scary, man. It's awful. Um. But six weeks after I stopped taking it, I began to get back to myself. I began to feel better. I began, I was still battling a little bit of amnesia, but I was feeling better and feeling back to myself. Even went to work. I was working part-time at Bed Bath & Beyond, even though the doctor was like, you can't work. But I started working when I was 13. That's what I do. I work. I don't like to collect checks. I like to work. And so that's what I did. And so even when I interviewed, dude had no idea I was sick and I was in the middle of amnesia. I'm just sitting there, did all that. So long story short, I got better. The amnesia pretty much was going away. By the end of October of 2016, I was pretty much recovered. Mm. So how did, uh, how did the chosen, um, not the, cho the Cha Cha channel, come about so at this point in my life things were going were going back up had some hard patches but overall things were still in the right direction so you're fast forward now to you know this time in the last two and a half years starting um <coughs> me and my daughter were inseparable we were like this <coughs> and I am we, she basically dropped a bombshell on me. We were going through some struggles. Um, but this was completely out of left field. And then after that, then we get some really serious news about my mom. But then my mom and my daughter, you know, they there were things that were happening that were not correct, weren't right. And, um, you know, things that were, they shouldn't have been happening. And it really caused me a lot of hurt. People getting involved in my household that should have never gotten involved. Um, 
interfering where they shouldn't have interfered. I am there. And, and then because I am a believer, I was basically like I was the bad person because I was really sticking to my faith. And I am so I was, you know, going through a lot. It was a lot of trauma. So basically during that time with the bombshell that was dropped on me and then things with my, my you know, my mom, I am. It was becoming too much. It became too much. I had just started the new job, the job that I work at now. And then I get this bombshell. And um, I just started going on my personal Facebook page. And I just started sharing about my life and things that were happening. But I did it in such a way that I didn't say specific details and all of that because I don't believe in using social media to hurt people. And that's not my place to do that. And God doesn't like us to do that. So I didn't do that. I was just sharing some of my woes and asking for prayer, sharing things about the word. And then as the months went on, I could begin to feel the Lord. People can benefit from my pain, from my life experiences. And I'm, and I'm, the Lord began to lead me. Go on to YouTube. Go on to YouTube. Because <laughs> there was already a couple of bigger YouTubers that I interact with on social media. So I was kind of familiar with it. But for me to do it, that was like, wow, I don't know about that. So then um, I, I was filling it and I didn't do it lightly.